Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the first episode of the Lyft HV Remote Roundtable from Hudson Valley Pattern for Progress. In the coming weeks, we will be releasing a roundtable discussion every Wednesday covering topics from professional development, leadership, communication, and connection. My name is Eric Pearson. I'm a senior research planner at Pattern for Progress, and I'll be moderating today's remote roundtable discussion on managing in all directions. So obviously at the top of everyone's minds right now is the COVID-19 pandemic. We're all feeling that physical, mental, financial impacts of the virus. And if you watch the news, you'll hear a lot about how this is impacting the national economy and harming our businesses. So for today's roundtable discussion, we're gonna zoom into a more personal point of view uh, and discuss what we can all personally do to continue to lead and be productive in the midst of this crisis. Uh, whether you're in a leadership position, part of a team, uh, self-employed, or even out of the job. So we've assembled three excellent panelists to give us some uh, insight on this topic. I'm joined remotely today by Dr. Lubna Somji, principal of Lubna Somji PhD since 2005. Dr. Somji is a psychologist and executive coach who's passionate about using science to affect change and growth. She began her business with a vision to help people and organizations grow and thrive with a thread of diversity and inclusion throughout her work. We're also joined today by Chris for short. Chris is the executive director of the New Paltz Regional Chamber of Commerce. For over 20 years, Chris has worked with large scale industrial manufacturing teams, small local businesses and nonprofits, educating others in the aspects of complex marketing and communications. Chris uh, also uses his digital marketing experience to advise companies and organizations in identifying their brand voice in a noisy and congested digital space. And last but not least, we have Nicholas Morrow. Nick is the manager of recruitment and workforce development at Marist College and is the principal and owner of Your Career Spark LLC, a career services and management consulting firm. His experience includes all aspects of people at work, organizational development, human resources consulting, and individual career services. So thank you all for joining me today. I think we'll start with Nick. Um, first question to you. With millions of people around the, uh, around the country now working remotely, how are people adapting? And from what you're seeing, if you could speak to what's working, what's not working, and, and how we can all do better to work together. Sure. Well, I think if you're, if you're for-profit, you know, you're non-profit, you're big, you're small, um, you're a business owner, you're in the C-suite, um, you have a big team, a small team, I think. Um, regardless, you know, I think people have to be a high priority right now. Um, sure, you know, your operations, your budget, um, forecasting and modeling of what the future looks like is, is obviously critically important. But um, people in a crisis, you know, their, first, their, their minds first turn to, you know, survival and their like basic needs. And, you know, I think we have to remember and consider what does it mean right now? Like, what is the, the, the foundation of being a leader, right? It's making a positive impact in an industry, a positive impact on people's lives. And people right now are going to get you through, I think, the crisis, help your organization remain, you know, viable and strong and help you, you know, on that recovery on the other side, which I think is something that we're going to try to touch on a little bit today, too. So, um, you know, if you are a leader right now, you're being pulled in many different directions. But um, I think there's there's a couple things you can do if you're in a leadership role right now. Um, one, the first, which, which to me, like, lays over all of it. Um, is transparency. In, in a crisis, uh, transparency is like job number one by a mile. You know, be clear right now um, of, you know, what you know, what you don't know, um, and what you're doing to try to learn more. Everybody wants answers, health, economically, financially, is my job still going to be here? And if you don't know yet, um, in your in your role, what, what, whatever size or scale or scope of your responsibilities, what, what May looks like, or what June looks like, or that next year looks like, um, say so. You know, take your transparency and your candor to a whole other level. You know, right now, because your role as a leader, I think, right now, um, and what we're seeing um, in organizations that are remaining strong right now, is, um, is is like an optimistic and realistic outlook, right? That's how you're going to rally everybody around you. That's how you're going to remain kind of charismatic. Because, you know, the reason we all work together and everybody doesn't work independently in society is we like to be a part of something larger than ourselves, right? So if you're optimistic and realistic, and I keep going back to those two words lately, 
you're going to have like a power, powerful effect um, where you're going to rally everybody to be a part of the recovery. And that's really where we all want to get to is, is that recovery. So if you are giving out a false sense of security um, or you're not really communicating at all, you know, you're going to have a hard time, I think, pulling the team back along when it's, it's time to, you know, to, to, to go forward. So part of that transparency, too, is frequent frequency of your updates. You know, if you're in a leadership role and no one really knows what's going on or where you're at or what, you know, the organization or the business is looking at, you know, I think you're doing everybody a disservice. So I think transparency has to come first. Um, beyond that, expectations, right? Um, goals, you know, thinking, thinking small, thinking digestible, thinking attainable, you know, weekly. If you told me two months ago, you knew we were going to be here, you know, I mean, come on, you know, no one thought we'd be here and who knows where we're going to be in a month or two months or three months or six months. So if your management style right now is, is talking about six month projects, I mean, I think you're, you're missing the mark a little bit. So small, attainable, you know, we want to build, rebuild momentum, right, from scratch, you know, something you can achieve this week, this day. Um, and then as far as communications too, um, uh, you know, the when and the how, like give a foundation of like human contact all over again, right? You know, when am I going to hear, you know, from my manager and how too, right? So this is when we're going to do a call. This is when you're going to hear from me, you know, via email, because if you have folks out there. Um, with so much other uncertainty, and they can't even lean on you for any kind of sense of normalcy, which is still, you know, 40 or so hours of, of, of your week, I think you're going to lose people really quickly as like fatigue kind of sets in. Like in many cases, we're just getting started, right? So we want to keep people engaged with being transparent and setting expectations. And the third piece, I think, in, in leadership right now is giving people a chance to be heard or giving people a, a voice. So um, you know, what's being done, what's being accomplished right now. Um, everyone in the, in the organization, in the business should feel like they have a chance to be heard, right? So that could be anything from um, celebrating some small victories um, or, or just, you know, if somebody has an innovative idea, you know, right, right now, who knows where, you know, the, the, the solution to leading everything forward, you know, kind of comes from right now. So those are my big three, I think, right now, regardless if it's a small team, a big team, you're the C-suite, you're the business owner. If you're being transparent, be uncomfortably transparent. Be wide open about what's going on. Um, and you're communicating realistic, um, attainable expectations, and you're giving people a chance to be heard. I mean, I, I think you're going to be okay. And I know, Lubna, you deal you know, and work with a lot of executives um, of, of all types. Does any of that kind of like, you know, resonate with you or anything you're, you know, you're seeing in your work right now? No, absolutely, Nick. I think, I think the, the phrase that you use being positive and realistic is spot on. Um, you know, you never want to be overly positive. You don't want to be Pollyanna because then people are scared. They don't think that you understand the breadth or the gravity of the situation. Um, so as long as you convey positivity, but also realism in terms of, you know, we don't know this, this, and this, but we are working towards it in these ways. I think that that can go a long way towards helping people feel um, supported and feel like the organization is really working to help them. And they are more likely to then put in the effort as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about the, the communication piece. I agree 100% with what Nick's saying that. Those regular touch points are really important. Uh, the staff that I'm working with, I have interns, uh, I have staff, and we have scheduled meetings that kind of uh, put that on the radar so people have something necessarily to look forward to, but to know, all right, we're going to have these milestones that we're going to hit. Here are my marching orders moving forward. And I think just having people out there floating uh, is definitely, to the next point, you know, doing a disservice to the team, especially when everyone's been so invested and now this is the new normal, right? This is a new way of working and we have to get over technology hurdles. We're here on Zoom. You know, this is a new way of working for a lot of people. And for some, this is definitely old hat. We've been doing it for years. So it's really trying to bridge the gap between taking that in-person day-to-day that, that was the norm for years and now bridging it into something, you know, right now where technology can be a hurdle but really, I see it as a way to kind of broaden and deepen those relationships to the point of actually having those conversations, being open, being honest, as he said, and you know, making it realistic. The, the big thing, I think, 
is giving people long-term goals to show that there is a little bit of a, you know, there's a future that we're shooting for and we're building infrastructure. But those day-to-day, those week-to-week phone calls, uh, Zoom meetings, keep the ball moving downfield. And I think there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people that struggle with trying to maintain that normalcy in a time like this. But I think we're starting to get the you know get the groove and move forward. Great. So I'm I'm hearing that um, among the most important things is transparency, uh, keeping some kind of sense of normalcy and consistency and flexibility to you know adapt to this new normal as we call it. Um, Chris, I'm actually interested. Um, we heard a lot about from all three of you, sort of some of the some of the tactics that that work with this new normal. Um, in your experience with the chamber, have you seen um, anything, any businesses that have taken a different tack that may have not worked out as well? Sort of the what's not working. Well, I'll, I'll go 180 degrees. What's not working is going radio silent. Okay, I've, yeah. seen, I've seen a lot of people uh, sort of freeze under you know things like this. I mean, let's be honest, the last 10 years, our country's been going up and to the right. Everything's been, you know, pretty good. And a lot of, a lot of leadership have kind of ridden that wave. And now it's time to be tested, right? There's a point in time where we have a huge obstacle that's never really been encountered in this, um, you know, this environment, the social, you know, political, the, 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 the whole idea of work and business is all upended. So, People are sort of treading the water. I, I was on the phone the other day with a gentleman uh, that I work with very closely. And, you know, the, the analogy of being thrown into the deep end of the pool. For the first two weeks, we've been basically just in survival mode, you know, coming up for air, treading water. And now what we're starting to see is people start, you know, finding those swim buddies and starting, to, you know, conversations like this. Where are, the, where are the life rafts? Where are the people that are, you know, seeing something that works? What doesn't work is isolating yourself and, and taking all that pressure on yourself. I, for one, you know, I, I running the chamber, sometimes I feel like I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders. So it's having the ability to be humble and reach out and say, I don't have the answers and I need some help. I think a lot of people take that burden on. And I'm, Lubna, I know that's something I think from the psychologically for businesses and teams, how does that play into, you know, your work? So... I think I think that's spot on as well. I mean, I think um, for me, one of the things I think businesses should be thinking about um, are sort of what to do to prepare for the next phase of COVID, right? So obviously, we're, leadership is in crisis mode. We're trying to make sure that our employees are safe, that they're supported. We're trying to make sure our customers, clients, patients are safe as well. We're trying to work as best we can, um, you know, to maintain services or products. And hopefully leaders in organizations are also helping the communities they're in. Because obviously many organizations are only as strong as their communities. And we simply go further when we go together. But if leadership hasn't done it already, I think a really useful next step is to formally plan what direction your organization is going to need to go in to manage the next phase of COVID. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty with that. We don't know what that next phase will be. We hope that it will be the slowing of the virus, um, but we don't know. Um, And obviously, we don't know what the economic landscape will be. But what I think most of us are hypothesizing is that things are not going to be the same. So clients, customers, consumers, they're going to be different. They're going to have different needs and priorities. They're going to have different resources. We know the supply and distribution chain is going to be different as well. organizations, liquid assets, we know are going to be different. And the people we typically partner with or um, invest, um, who invest in us, those partnerships are going to change as well. And so, again, it's important for leadership to create sort of an internal team and direct some resources towards that team to brainstorming things. And I think there's sort of three things to keep in mind when you put together that internal team. One is the process. Um, There's different ways to do this, but one way to do it is to have your team collect information about where you are now um, and think about where your organization might be in two weeks, a month, uh, a quarter, six months, a year. Hypothesize where your organization will be, including your best case scenario and your worst case scenario. 
and where you know the economic landscape will be, what your sources of cash might be, how you want to recover as a business, meaning some businesses are going to want to try to go back to status quo as much as possible. Some people are going to want to change their business model entirely. Some people may change businesses, right? So um, try to have your group first collect as much information as possible, knowing that that information will be imperfect. Run possible business scenarios um, in terms of the best case and the worst case scenario, what you might need, and start developing some recommendations for multiple strategies, depending on where your organization is. is. Um, you know, obviously, ultimately, decision making will be made by a smaller, more centralized group, but that internal team can certainly inform you by providing you with multiple scenarios and recommendations. So that process is that first step. Um, the second step sort of speaks to what you just said earlier, Chris. Um, go outside your bubble. So for executives or people in leadership positions in their organizations, um, obviously, People in this internal team, you want to go to people you've gone to before whom you trust, but you also want to call people from different departments in your organization, or if it's a smaller company, different specialties at all different levels for a couple of reasons. One, um, it allows you to get a more robust picture of where your organization might be. Again, best case scenario, worst case scenario. And when you call all those different people together, you're also harnessing the science of diversity. We know that diverse teams simply outperform teams that are not diverse, um, including, you know, demographics, um, specialties, things like that. Um, they outperform them in terms of decision making and creative solutions. So again, when you create that internal team, go a little bit outside your usual internal bubble. And another way that I think executives should go outside their bubble. Um, which I don't see as many do, is especially at that executive level, um, at a minimum, go outside your organization and connect with other leaders, either in your industry, um, adjacent to your industry, maybe um, talk with people you normally wouldn't, um, that economics professor who can shed light on your industry, right? Or that specialist in leadership development, management, the, um, you know, the public health experts, again, depending on your industry, really stretch. Um, you can connect with these leaders in your community, but I would encourage you to stretch further and start connecting with leadership um, across your state and across the country, and of course, more if possible people who you've heard of, know through someone, met at conferences, things like that. And then the last thing to think about when you're putting together these internal teams is especially that internal team when it comes to starting to provide recommendations for possible strategies, you want to make sure that they feel very comfortable iterating over and over again um, and coming up quickly with solutions and ideating as much as possible. Um, it's about iterating quickly. It's about making sure those teams know that it's okay to put forth half-baked ideas, that more ideas are better, right? That quantity over quality right now matters, even though it feels counterintuitive. Um, it allows people to kind of safely put out ideas, um, but also this kind of iteration, this kind of problem solving, often sparks more creative thinking, which, which we need right now. Great. Um, actually, I have a question. With the understanding that it's sort of different um, for every scenario, you know, businesses are different, could you speak a little bit to how, what we were talking about before, the transparency plays into the process that you just talked about for, for planning to the next step? Like how much, how transparent are you in letting the broader audience know that you someone is taking the steps to figure out how you know the business is going to adapt to this new normal yeah no, i think that's a good question i think it speaks to what's been said before um it's okay to say that we don't know where our company is going to be in two weeks or a quarter or six months um i think that you look sort of you risk looking quite foolish if you do right mm -hmm. um but i think to piggyback that with because we don't know, here's all the things that we're doing. We're putting together people, we're reaching outside our organization for fresh ideas, 
we are iterating, we are modeling solutions, um, and we are looking for solutions from you, from anyone, right? So I think it's important to be transparent as long as you're also providing um, information on how you're going about um, creating more certainty and creating more solutions. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, Chris, you had mentioned before how different people are sort of dealing with the new normal of virtual communication um, differently. So I was wondering if in what you've seen um, at the chamber, in, you know, in this new norm of, of virtual connections, how can we maintain, you know, both personal boundaries and, and work boundaries? And, and maybe you could speak to what you've seen in your, in your role as the executive director of the chamber and maybe just personally as well. And then I would open that up to both to, to Nick and Dr. Somji as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think right now, for me at least, obviously I got an in-home studio that I built. Um, I have the luxury of having a background in video and marketing and things like that. So having equipment some is a norm for me. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, the idea of being connected 24-7 is starting to create a lot of stress. There's a lot of people that are uh, reaching out to employees or even you know employers at 8 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock on a Saturday, things like that. And the lines, the work hours are starting to blur. So one of the missions I have is obviously trying to have a, a cohesive schedule so that way the, the people that I supervise can expect those communications at certain times. And, uh, you know, I repeat over and over, do not feel obligated. If you see me send something out, we could talk about it at our next meeting, on a phone call. We're very uh, avid Slack users right now. I have nine interns and they all worked uh, in the local area. They went to school at SUNY, New Paltz, and they've all been scattered to the winds. But I am so impressed by the way how they have actually used the Slack channel and personal communications to kind of stay connected. But at the same time, when we're talking about boundaries, we kind of keep those conversations there. So it's a little bit easier to maintain and manage instead of countless emails. For some though, email is their, their primary way of communicating. So I've actually set up buckets uh, in my emails to, to look at how I can start sorting through what's important, what's not, and kind of reiterate with the team if you had a nine to five schedule, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of work wiggle there because you take care of kids or you're, you're taking care of a, a parent. I'm Gen X, so I'm kind of balancing both right now, as well as the staff that you work with or work for. So letting people up front that the milestones that you're trying to hit and the deadlines that you're setting forth have a target. So you can shoot for that and we can fit in our work hours you know, because we have to be flexible during this time and have that expectation of really understanding nine to five still exists for a lot of people. It's hard for some people to turn off their brain. I'm guilty of that sometimes, but on the weekends, sometimes I just have to watch Netflix and, and just hang out, turn my brain off. You have to recharge. If not, we're going to see some serious burnout of executives and work teams in the months to come because everybody feels obligated to stay on 24 seven. Uh, I'm guilty of that early on in this crisis. You know, 18 hour days was not healthy, not sustainable. I've backed way off on that to try and figure out what's important and really start digging through those items in my inbox and a lot special time throughout the day to answer email, emails, take phone calls, meet with your team. So then that way you feel productive because at first I felt like I wasn't doing enough and a lot of that stress starts compounding. You don't see it as much at first, right? And that's where that burnout comes from. It sneaks up on you. And then one day you, you've got the, you know, you've got the, the worn down feeling. And what it does is it impacts the work teams that you're trying to lead, right? So if you don't keep yourself healthy, you don't keep yourself motivated, you don't keep yourself on target, the team, you know, from leading in front, the team will start seeing you, you kind of falling apart and, I have a fantastic board of directors that I rely on heavily to help through this crisis, as well as a lot of the work teams that I'm on, you know, personal colleagues, things like that, where we set those boundaries that there's a handful of people, that close knit circle of influence that I, I talk to you usually on a daily basis for that sanity check to make sure that I'm hitting all those targets. But at the same time, five, six o'clock rolls around, 
we're going to go radio silent until the morning. You need to spend time with family. You need to spend time with yourself. And I think that's a big piece moving forward. I think it's um, important. It's a little bit of the other side of the coin too, right? That I mean, the virus itself, right? And the pandemic affects everybody, right? It doesn't discriminate. So I, I think in all of this too, you know, back to that very first, you know, question, uh, Eric, about, you know, what's working, what's not working. I think um, we need to start paying a little bit more attention to those who are not in leadership roles. You know, they're not the CEO. They don't own the business. They are, you know, the gears in the machine. They're making everything happen. They're part of a team, but maybe they don't supervise anybody. And that's the vast majority of the workforce that's now, that's now remote. And I think they're, you know, they quickly um, have kind of been forgotten uh, a little bit. And, and they're going to be the ones you're going to need to lean on on the other side um, in that recovery, you know, which is what Lubna was uh, was was diving into, um, which is where you're going to need an engaged and strong team. So, you know, so 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 what about them? I mean, I think if you're you're joining us today and, and you're part of a team, but maybe you're not you don't have supervisory like responsibilities. Um Maybe this is a time to shine, you know, if you're not in a leadership role, being flexible, you know, to Chris's point, we all need to be flexible right now. I think in a normal work environment, right, you probably have high standards and high expectations of your manager. You want a development path, you want attainable goals, you want to know where you're, where you're going to be in a year, you know, those kinds of things. But now is not the time, right? You know, I think we all need to be flexible. We all need to think short term. Um you know, I think this is a time to kind of solidify and bet on what you're good at. You know, right now, if you're part of a team, you have a particular role, keep doing what you're doing. You know, now is a time to keep contributing, you know, at a high level. But at the same time, if you're part of a team, um, you have a good perspective, you know, during the crisis where you can you can see gaps, you know, right? Um, whether it's nine interns or it's it's it doesn't matter who you are. There's gaps, right? There's communication gaps. There's work that's not being done or not being done as, as well. And if you're part of a team, look for those gaps right now. There's opportunity even amongst even amongst a, a crisis. You know, support your manager. They don't have answers. This isn't the time, you know, to sit down with them. I would say over a cup of coffee, but you know, we know that's not a reality anytime soon. But um, you need to build a new working relationship with your manager in the same way they need to connect with you kind of all over again. So, um, you know, anticipate their needs, anticipate, you know, the needs of the team. If you have leadership aspirations, which, you know, many of you do, um, you know, if you can't manage yourself, you're not going to be able to lead a team one day, right? So use this as an opportunity to manage yourself more closely, give yourself, you know, a schedule goals challenge yourself you know right now if you want to be in a leadership role if you want to lead a team if you want to run your own business you might be in the driver's seat one day during a crisis like this in your, in your lifetime so use it as a little bit of a case study um and what would you do and how would you do it and, and can you know manage right the, what are the old saying manage that company of one manage the organization of one and do that well which, which you, you then, you know, um, to, to, to some of Chris's points, you're not contributing, you know, to, to, to the panic. I think we've all kind of touched on that a little bit, you know, remaining, remaining strong, being, um, be like, be that trusted voice of like calm and confidence and somebody, your manager, your, your, your owner, your CEO can lean on um, because, you know, this is a, as much as it's a crisis and it's a terrible stretch, you know, during all of our lives, being able to manage through a crisis is, is a skill set, you know. So I think um, the silver lining, you know, if you're if you're if you're new, you know, into the workforce or you're in a junior role, it's a it's a learning opportunity for, from from everybody. So I would, you know, try to find the positives, contribute, be the be the rock, be the foundation. You, you there's nothing preventing you from reaching out to the other department that you never interact with. Saying, hey, you know, we're doing X, Y, and Z this week. You know, like, what are you guys up to? Do you guys want to all you know, sit around on a Zoom call and eat our lunch and talk about, you know, the challenges we're having or the things we're achieving. So um, I think that's really super important right now because the team is going to be the ones that on the other end of this elevate everybody and lift everybody back up. Um, and we can't forget them. So whether you're part of a team or you are a leader, um, you know, it's remaining flexible. It's respecting boundaries, right? You know, to, to, to Chris's point, you know, managing yourself because, we're all in this together and we're all going to be a part of the solution too. And I think that's really super important to remember right now is that this is affecting everybody. Um, and if we all want to be on the other side of it in, in, in a good shape, you know, manage yourself, support your team, 
um, and be part of the solution. Dr. Samji, does that does that resonate with you as well? Um, I'm I'm sure that in your in position that burnout is definitely a topic that you discuss, especially with executives. So, uh, did you want to speak a little bit to the boundaries and and what's going on now with people being inundated? probably by more and more emails than they ever, they ever had and more and more different technologies, ways to communicate. You're being bombarded. Um, I know I am, and I'm not an executive, so. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to talk a little bit on ways that um, we can sort of steady ourselves as leaders, but I wanted to piggyback on uh, Chris and Nick. Nick, I think, you know, absolutely. I think everyone has a role to play and now's the time to play it. And I, I say this ad nauseum and I apologize, but we really simply do go further when we go together. So, um, and to Chris's point in terms of setting limits, I think that that is something that all companies need to be working towards. Um, there are some industries though where that's not going to be able to happen. Obviously healthcare is the big one. And the one thing I wanna say before I sort of segue into how to steady yourself is that I hope that leadership in healthcare uh, healthcare administrators in particular, that not only are you providing, you know, the appropriate logistical support to your healthcare staff, but that you're providing consistent, targeted, structured, emotional support to your healthcare staff. Because the reality is, you know, I've, I've worked with physicians, I used to train them. It is amazing the kinds of things they see during the course of a normal lifetime um, that they need support. For, and now more than ever. So I'm hoping hospital administrators will do that because they are an industry that cannot work nine to five. Um, but in terms of the question you posed, yes, um, I think it's important to set those boundaries. Um, you know, one thing that I would say that leaders should be doing amongst all the other things that they're doing is they really need to learn how to study themselves. The leaders to me that tend to stand out in terms of their ability to think critically and problem solve and be creative um, are the, the leaders that take time out to study themselves. And, you know, when it comes to COVID, this is, this is a marathon, this isn't a sprint, and we need to be able to pace ourselves. You know, leadership is challenging enough under the best of circumstances. It's complicated. There's lots of moving parts. And so steadying yourself allows you to make good decisions, be thoughtful, um, not be impulsive, stay cool and clear-headed. And it also allows employees to remain steady as well. Because um, if you're a hot mess, um, that's going to be contagious. I mean, that's just the reality. So um, I'm going to review very quickly um, a few, like about five or six coping skills that leaders can engage in, but really any of us can do. They're all very simple. The key to it is to start today. Don't wait till you hit a wall, right? Because if you hit a wall, it's kind of like throwing a pebble at a charging bear. Uh, not that I've done that, but one would imagine it wouldn't work very well, right? So step number one, pause. Just pause. Take a break. Step back. Really try to take in the breath and magnitude of the situation that we're in and allow yourself to identify any feelings that you're having about it to name them and the thoughts behind it because those feelings of uncertainty or stress or even fear are there um, whether you want to attend to them or not and if you don't attend to them if you don't identify them if you don't work with them you'll leak and you don't want to be leaky right uh, remembering that these feelings that you're feeling are just simply your body trying to protect you trying to gear you up for a challenge um, but that in spite of that fear, you are okay in this moment, you are steady in this moment, and you can focus on what you can control in this moment. So step one, pause. The second thing is be very clear about your purpose. Um, what are you committed to right now? We know that the more you focus on purpose and what you're committed to, the more likely you are to stay resilient during a time of crisis. Um, that purpose that you have at work and home might be different than it was three months ago, right? So for me personally, my purpose is to keep my family safe and sane, which is a little bit different than what it was three months ago, right? Um, and at work, it's to maintain my services, but it's also to support other business leaders and businesses, right? 
So be very clear about what your purpose is and know that it might change from week to week as things unfold. Three, a little trick to do at the end of each day is to simply take stock of what went well. Um, our brains are all wired to focus on threats or things that are negative. So we really sort of have to literally work out our brains to focus on things that are neutral or positive during the course of a normal day. So one of the things I recommend is at the end of the day, list five things that occurred that day that either made you happy, that you were grateful for or thankful for. These are gonna be small things. Um, and don't repeat for at least a week or two, right? So list those five things. The fourth thing, simple mindfulness-based meditation. When I first heard about meditation, um, you know, using it with leadership, using it even in my psychotherapy, um, I sort of cringed. I tend to be a bit of a skeptic about everything until I see the science. The science is really incredibly compelling. And I won't get into it other than to give you a resource, um, a resource that I really like that I would recommend to anyone, including leadership, would be a book called Mindfulness. Finding Peace in a Frantic World. They also have a great website um, called franticworld.com that has a lot of tips on meditation as well as mindfulness. Start today, even if it's 10 minutes, right? Connect and play with people. Make sure that you're spending a lot more time with loved ones, having meaningful dinners, teas, coffees, conversations, uh, you know, not at the expense of people's lives, do it virtually, but spend more time with people and play hard. Um, those kind of things can help executives sort of untangle the knots in their brains and free them up to be more creative and problem solve. And then the last thing I'll mention, which a lot of people have mentioned, is please, please limit your news intake. Um, some executives do depend on the news for their particular industries, and that's understood. But you can limit how many times a day you check the news and for how many minutes. Try to read print media as much as possible instead of watching the news. Try to go to websites that deliver facts as opposed to sensationalism. And be careful in social media. You know, you may be scrolling down Facebook to see if, you know, your friend was able to get toilet paper or, you know, what, what they made for dinner. But there's a lot of COVID information. I cannot tell you how many people, when they severely limit their news and social media intake, will say to me how much less anxious they feel even after just two or three days. So those would be some of the tips that are sort of easy and quick to do. Excellent, thank you. That sounds like great advice for everyone mm -hmm. uh, during normal circumstances uh, and certainly, certainly right now during this crisis. Um, I think we'll go next to to Chris. Um, you mentioned before that you have a rather large team at, that includes um, a number of interns. Um, so switching gears a little bit again, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how um, mentorship uh, plays out in uh, under these circumstances and what role that plays right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as it was stated before by Nick and Lubna, the idea of reaching out of your network and out of your bubble is huge for me. Mentorship has really crafted my career over the last 15 plus years. And I can honestly say that it was those key people that got me through tough times, helped me make very important decisions, a lot of tough decisions, career-wise, personal-wise. And the trick to mentorship is a lot of people feel no matter where they are in their career, that they don't have anything to offer somebody behind them or someone you know that's up and coming. The idea here is there's a great book out there called Managing Up, Managing Down. And the concept behind everything in mentorship, especially now, is to find someone that you look up to, somebody that you aspire to. We should have this all the time, uh, regardless of this crisis or not. You should have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of. The key to that is they're not personally invested in your success or failure. A lot of people approach their managers thinking that they are mentors, and that is a huge misconception. Managers are task-based. Now, I've been lucky over my 20-plus year career to have two that were able to do both, and that is a rarity uh, in, in business and in everything from academics to uh, you know manufacturing to whatever. I've worked overseas 
for a, a, a many years. And even there, the idea of task-based directives confused and muddied the waters a little bit where a lot of people were looking to their manager to help them get a leg up with their career or kind of show them where they're going. And that's just not the case. I think a lot of people have that misconception. So what you want to do is reach out to somebody, uh, use your LinkedIn profile to actually talk to people, not just accept invitations and say happy birthday. I think when you broaden and deepen your sphere of influence, you start bumping into people that think like you, that, that you want to think more like, be more like, and those business you know, executives or somebody that runs a nonprofit or anything like that, if you can latch onto them and actually approach them and say, hey, look, I look up to you. There's a lot of colleagues that, and it doesn't have to be age-based too. A lot of people feel that it's, well, this person's, you know, 20 years older, my senior, and this person is 10 years my younger, and there's nothing to be learned. What I found is when you open it up, there's a lot of people that have something to offer that you may not, you know, have that skill set. So when you find somebody that actually has uh, a trait or a characteristic, or you see them speak somewhere, or you read a blog post, or they stop in and they say hi, and instantly we all know what that chemistry looks like. That's what you're looking for in a mentor. Somebody that doesn't judge you, somebody that will go out. And I think most people, I've been flattered myself and I've flattered others by saying, hey, I would love to just sit down and and have a, a phone call once a month, every six months, or something like that. I met an individual at a conference down in New York City six years ago, and we just bumped in, um, you know, getting coffee in between lectures, and we hit it off. And this is somebody that I talk to on a regular basis every two, three months, just to check in and see what's going on. So I think we need that. The, the flip side of that is managing down that your role as a leader or even somebody in, you know, like a task-based job, that's fine. Like Nick was alluding to before, you don't have to be a leader. You don't have to be 40 years old or more to have a protege. Everyone has something to share. And I think early on in my career, I made the mistake that you think everything that you know, one thing my father said years ago was don't apologize for what you know. And once you start breaking that down and figuring out that there are skill sets and there's experience and there's things that you may have that someone else doesn't have, we, we get into this routine thinking that, oh, well, everybody knows this. And they don't. And I think it's very important for you to reach down to somebody that you feel could use that information. It could be reach across. It could reach up. It's not a vertical hierarchy when it comes to mentorship that we're talking about managing from all directions, right? There's a lot of times where you come across something and this is the perfect time for that test to happen. We could share best practices now that we've seen either five years ago, 10 years ago with people, your senior, your junior, a lateral move within the company and be like, hey, here's a time to park your ego and share information because we are, you know, all of us have been talking today about how we're all in this together. Mentorship plays a huge role in that. And I think if you look through the lens of bettering your team and your surroundings and deepening yourself by getting different perspectives, mentorship should be front and center. And it's really the core of innovation with my team. I've always um, loved the, the concept. Um, Christy and I have talked about this before. A personal board. Right, you know, looking at your role, your charge, your your uh, your business, um, you know, how is any successful nonprofit or company run, which is you know infinitely complex? It's managed by an engaged, diverse board, right? So why not have a, a strong board that's supporting and steering you? Different industries, right? Different perspective, different perspectives, different like depth. Uh, of experience. Um, I've always loved that analogy. So why not build right now during a crisis, your own little personal board, um, everybody bring something different to the table that can help lift you up um, and keep you, you know, well positioned and, and mindful and um, about all the decisions that, that you're making. I've always loved that, 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 that concept. And I think now more than ever, regardless of who you are, um, you, you need that support system um, whether you're a manager or not a manager, you know, owning your own business or, or whatever you are, um, we all need it right now. And there's nothing, um, it's not any kind of like slight or criticism. I think we all need support right now. So, so seek it out. Cause I think maybe more than ever, 
we're all willing to help. I think we're all willing to help each other. So, you know, capitalize on it, build those new connections and, uh, and support each other to um, and help us get to the other side of this. It's funny you mentioned that, Nick. I think maybe two years or three years after I started my business, um, I created sort of my own personal board of directors. They have no stake in my business, obviously, um, but they are people I turn to for advice, to brainstorm, to review things. And one of the things that's helped with that board of directors is keeping it really diverse. Um, these people are from all over the country. In fact, I don't think I even have anyone on my board that's from New York State. Um, some of them are in my industry. Some of them are in completely different industries, which often sparks a lot of creative ideas. And they're really diverse in terms of age, race, sex, which gives me a really different vantage point, right? As opposed to if everyone on my board were a middle-aged Asian woman, right, in the same industry as me. So I think that's a great idea. And I think, Chris, you know, like you said, when you're looking for a mentor or you're looking to mentor, mentor someone who kind of doesn't look like you, think like you. And I think that those kinds of relationships can really, um, you know, develop into um, amazing things with problem-solving capabilities that you might not have otherwise. Sticking with the, that theme of um, managing in all directions, in, in the time of this uh, pandemic when everyone's working remotely, have, have you seen um, sort of a dynamic shift in, in some aspects of, of the workplace in terms of perhaps some of the, of the younger people who logistically just are better equipped to be working remotely, um, just dealing with Zoom and all the different technologies um, and, and perhaps have to manage upwards a little bit and, and teach uh, maybe their, their boss how to use this, these tools and how to more effectively use these tools and what that, what that kind of dynamic has been like, if you've seen that. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's happening right now is that dynamic shift. shift. And what it's doing is it's leveling, I guess, the hierarchy of work, right? So if you look at it just through the lens of a webcam here, we are literally all on the same page. And I think this is sparking a new way of innovation when it comes to sharing and managing, uh, you know, workplaces. A big, you know, a quote that I always use uh, that kind of gets me through is double down on your strengths. And I know what I am not good at, right? And I know who's good at different pieces. And the idea there is because there's, uh, you know, a younger generation that's a digital native that, that can use Slack and download apps and do all this kind of stuff, huge resource right now where they want to step up into to Nick's point earlier is, hey, I have this skill set and this is my way to contribute to the organization and how to do this, right? So that is something that I think a lot of people used to view as a negative in the past and now has become a trait, right? It's, you know, when, when the world falls apart, the person with the bicycle is the one that actually, you know, becomes king. And the idea there is that I've leaned, you know, I've reached out and leaned on my, my staff, uh, a lot of the interns in college. And like I said, I've got them Brooklyn, Rochester, they all scattered to the wind and it's like nothing. There was like very little disruption. It took like a week or two to get into a groove, but that's a huge piece. And I've asked them to help some of my board members and some of my colleagues that are struggling with, you know, how do I make this new landscape my own? And having those obstacles put in front of them that I think a lot of people don't realize you're more than what your business card says, right? Everybody looks at our titles and says, all right, you're in this box. And what I'm finding out right now is that a lot of people didn't realize the amount of resources that they actually had on their team, both young, both old, experienced, unexperienced, and how it has leveled the playing field for the greater good. Luna makes a great point that we all rise and move together, right? The old adage of rising tide lifts all boats. Well, right now we have a tsunami coming. And the only way to, to, to really get through this is to work collectively. And I found that when you empower those that have that skill, I always use you know the idea of trying to get out of the way. Right? I know that I can't do X, but this person's a pro. Try not to micromanage. And this is great for leadership and managers in general is you don't have to be in charge of everything. You can delegate authority 
with technology, with innovation, and it'll prove to be a huge asset to the team moving forward. And it empowers people to shine where they are. Nick made a great point earlier about, you know, this is your time to shine. And I think if people park their egos and be a little bit more humble and realize that, hey, this is something that, you know, the collective, uh, you know, brain power, the collective trust of ideas and skill sets is really going to push us through three months, six months from now, because we are redefining business. We are redefining work habits. And I think a lot of the, the infrastructure that's being built now around things like Zoom and Slack and Basecamp and a lot of different platforms that have been out there for year, years in the marketing world and people that have naturally worked remote, this is, a, this is a norm for them. But there's a huge influx of new people into our little digital social club and they're trying to navigate those waters. So, you know, be humble and say, hey, look, I don't know how to use this. Can you help me? And for some, that's a hurdle because it looks like failure through their eyes. But it's not. You'd be surprised how many people are willing to step up and say, hey, click the little button with the three dots in the corner and you're good to go. So I would definitely encourage people to kind of open up their eyes to the bigger picture of what this looks like moving forward. I uh, will thank all of you for this uh, very valuable discussion and thanks for sharing your, your insight. Um, what I wanted to do now as we wrap up is to just go around the horn and give each of you an opportunity to just give a brief closing statement, a takeaway for our viewers that have tuned in today. So I guess uh, let's just start with Nick, if you want to go ahead. Sure. I think um, the foundation of all of it um, is, is, is maintaining like a realistic perspective, right? Um, you know, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what next week brings. We can only control what we can control. And I think we all need to um, accept that and keep some humility uh, about, you know, how, how we uh, interact and work with each other, regardless of your role I mean, in whatever it is that you do, in whatever industry that it is. So, I mean, I, I'd say be a good coach, coach each other. Um, remove roadblocks. Don't be a roadblock. Empower the team. Empower others. Don't micromanage yourself. Be kind to yourself right now. Don't micromanage other people. Express interest, you know, and concern for other people's, you know, not just their productivity, but their personal well-being, because that's what's most important, you know, right now. Continue to be um, results-oriented. You know, don't worry so much about process. Just just focus on the goals that, that are attainable and reasonable. Um, be a good communicator. You have to listen, you know, right now, listen, you know, maybe more, maybe more than ever have a clear vision for the day. You know, don't worry so much about, you know, where we're going to be in, in, in two or three months. And, you know, maybe most important right now is knowing limits, know your own limits, you know, delegate when you can empower when you can, you know, if you wake up on a Thursday and it's just not your day and you just learned you know, you have family that's that's positive and they're not well. I mean, who knows what, what tomorrow brings? So be kind to yourself. Know your own limits. Take care of yourself. Take care of other people. And know that everybody has a role to play in the other side of this, in the other part of, of, of the other side of, of this whole, you know, crisis that, um, you know, we're all in this together. Um, and I think the solution is going to come from everyone and everywhere. And, um, you know, find productive uses for that anxiety, you know, innovate, you know, work on that pet project. I think you're interested in right now, do something new and exciting and innovative and reward yourself. I think for remaining, you know, remaining dedicated, um, and, uh, just keep that optimistic and realistic outlook that the other side is coming. Um, and just, you know, take, take one day, one day at a time. I mean, that's, that's all, um, I think we can all, we can all do together. So. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, how about we go next to Dr. Songji? Um, so I have sort of just two action items people can start this week. One is if you haven't already, um, go ahead and formalize that internal team to help you brainstorm for the next, um, you know, next phase of COVID. Um, and remember, reach outside your bubble to do that, um, both internally and also push outside the normal leaders you would talk to outside your community, outside your state, and so forth. And then the second action item is pick at least one way to kind of steady yourself this week that you haven't tried already. Um, try it this week and tell someone who can hold you accountable to do it. Awesome. Thank you, Lubna. And we'll end with Chris. 
Yeah, I think uh, in today's kind of uncertainty, I think celebrating success should be something that you bring to your teams to show that there are we're moving the needle. We're getting to a point of, uh, you know, milestones that are that are happening and things are good. So don't forget to celebrate success. You know, if that's somebody that's doing a great job and, you know, say thank you a little bit more. And if it is, you know, family and friends, you know, don't forget those birthdays. Don't forget those, you know, holidays that are coming. Easter's coming up. There's a lot of things that there's, there is positives and the world is still moving forward. So definitely um, celebrate success. One of the slides that I use at the end of all my presentations, it's a simple slide. It's very concise and it's something that I heard, you know, a few years ago and I just gravitated towards it. And I'm going to close on aspire to be a student of people. And by that, I mean, look around you. What's, what's in between, you know, the conversations? What's going on? Do you see somebody struggling? Do you see somebody being successful? Do you see somebody that has a new idea or something that you can share, best practice? So by being a student of people, you can, you can gather more information. I think we've all talked about that is to tap into your team and really pay attention. Nick made a point. Listen more than you talk. And I think you'll be surprised on what more you can hear just by being a student of people. And that's out in public, you know, if you're, you're being careful or if you're, you know, with your family or you're on a Zoom call like this, really learn about who you are and the people that you surround yourself with. And things will be great moving forward. Well, thanks once again to all three of you for joining us today. And thank you all for watching the first episode of the Lift HV Remote Roundtable. Mm -hmm.